I'm all down for tacos and tequila. Maybe after. Right? On another day, after you finish your show. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> She's our daughter. But she's never seen us before. I don't understand. Seven years ago, when she went missing, she was blind. What do you feel about the OA um, mm. resonated with your audience, just people in general? You know, it's such a good question. I, I'm not sure I really know. Sometimes I think it's funny we make these things and we put them out in the world and then we just have to see yeah. like what connects. But something I've heard people describe about it is that it has a kind of unfettered quality, that it seems like drinking milk that hasn't been pasteurized. And I think that's because it was mm. very handmade by a very small group of people, especially Zalbot Manglage, who's the show creator, and we, he directed all eight. I think it has a quality that feels handmade that doesn't usually manage to find its way onto television because usually so many voices or so many other entities touch a thing before it reaches its audience. So I think there's something kind of free and... and pure about it. And distinct, yeah. Yeah, it does feel like just wholly original. It feels like a distinctive voice. It, it, it feels like a, a small community made it. So yeah. It's, it's and I wonder if it was the same for you because when I watched... I, Insecure is the only show I have ever binge watched. Like I watched it like straight through once it was all out. Thank you. And I wonder, obviously there's a lot of reasons why it resonated for me. I think a lot because I was thinking about what it means for a woman to gain her voice in the world, the character that you play. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what you feel like resonated for. I think people just, uh, I think in, in, in television in general, like black people haven't really had a chance to just be, I guess just regular people have, sit in these, these moments of normalcy and mm -hmm. have conversations and not be weighed down by like, this is, this is race and this is the burden of being black in America. It's just like, you know, young people hanging out and, yeah. and talking in a way that I think we missed in, in the 90s. It hasn't been that way since the 90s. And, and just two female protagonists and two female best friends, two black female best friends shooting the shit and being, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Two black female best friends <laughs> talking. Ha talking, having a great time, yeah. and supporting each other. And I think there has been kind of, just in reality television, I don't know if you watch. Yeah. I avidly watch reality television, but I see there's just constantly pitting women against one another. Yeah, and completely. we don't really. Competition. Competition. Rather than like, how do you help each other get along in the world or. Exactly. Yeah. Well, what do I do wrong, Issa? Do you really want to know? Please tell me. Okay, have you noticed, Molly, the common denominator in all your can't find a man bullshit is you? Yeah, let's do the nigga rundown, Molly. One minute he's too thirsty. The next minute he's too distant. The next he's too gay. There was something about it that felt really exciting to me, which is like sometimes I think when women get the opportunity to write they f and, and you know, act in something, they feel the need to create these characters that are strong and flawless. Right. And because there's been so little representation of that. Completely. Because women are usually the second class citizen in the narrative. And I thought it was so cool that Insecure was taking this risk of showing women are also vulnerable right. and sometimes awkward and sometimes afraid. And it felt, something that felt in common with the OA is that they're both kind of origin stories. You're like watching a woman from the beginning become something. Completely. Rather than like from the outset, oh, she's this perfect thing. You know, this image of perfection we always sort of oppress women with maybe. Well, even in watching the OA, I wonder what, like, what are you tapping into specifically? Like I, the, the character, feels like you, you know her, you immediately feel for her. She's immediately vulnerable, mm. obviously, you know, she's, she's blind, so she yeah. has this affliction that she's dealing with. But what, do you, what were you tapping into in creating her? It was hard because in that first chapter, it, she comes back and she's this mysterious figure. And until she begins telling her story to that group of teenage boys, she seems, you're sort of on the outside of her. Like mm -hmm. you don't know what she's been through until she starts talking about it. And how do you identify with a character that seems kind of 
mad or crazy at the outset. But I think I tried when I finally sat down with a script and like took the writer hat off and the show creator hat off and just sat with the pages and felt like, okay, how as an actor do I make this person feel relatable? I think it was the feeling of, well, everybody knows what it's like to come home at some point and feel a stranger mm. to your home. Even if that's, you know, you went away to school and came back or you, you go and you try a job and you fail and you come home to lick your wounds. Like everybody knows what it means to return to your childhood bedroom and feel somehow foreign to mm -hmm. yourself, like that that space was never really yours or you're looking at, looking at yourself in a new way. So I tried to find the way into that. I don't know if, I don't know if I was wholly successful, but that was yeah, the attempt. I think you were. No, but you just brought up something that I, I, I do the same thing in terms of juggling the hats and I yeah. will completely disassociate. Um, from the fact that I'm going to be playing this role while yes. I'm in the writer's room. And so everything is fair game. Yeah. Like, and then once it's shooting time, then I'm like, oh, I have to execute this and I have to do it well and all yeah. these thoughts. But I don't know if you feel the same, but I think there was a, a part in season one where I was feeling like um, I'd, I'd seen my co-star Jay Ellis's like script notes yeah. and he is really thorough just about marking his script and, and getting into character and it really works for him. And I was, I brought it up in the writer's room that I felt like I didn't have enough time to prepare to play the role. <laughs> so I'm like, I felt that, I sometimes I feel like if, all my, if I just didn't have to do all these other jobs, I, I could really act well in this, yeah. But my, my, one of our writers, Ben Dugan, was like, well, you actually have the best character study by being in this room. So you right. technically had time. Yeah, you had time to prepare and you, you know the motivation of your character, you know, you know, you know the the past, you know yeah. the future, you know everything about what you're trying to contribute to the scene to begin with. Was there any moment though when you came to set where there was a scene where you just felt like, I don't know if I have this in me today? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> what was yes. the scene and what happened? Um, like, how did you get there? It was a really emotional scene, mm. and it was a scene. That, I mean, it was a confrontational scene between Jay Ellis and I, and oh, yeah. it was actually a fight scene between um, Yvonne Orji, who plays my best friend, and I. Yeah. And it was, they were both on the same day or back to back. And I just felt like up until that point, I just didn't feel ready and I hadn't done something like that in, mm -hmm. in years. Oh, wow. And I didn't know what to tap into. But then I relied on the actors. I'm big on, you know, what you give me, I'll yes. return. Yeah. And um, just tried to stay in the moment. What was the scene for you? Can I tell you the one scene that was my favorite that oh, you did? Please do. <laughs> when you guys are in the car coming home from Malibu together, <laughs> I just thought this is a brilliant moment of what friendship between women really is, which is that you guys were fighting and then your other friend started calling her out in the hot tub and then you suddenly <laughs> rise to her defense even though you guys are not talking to each other. And then you get in the car and when she's like, do you want to practice? your speech on me for like how you're going to get surreal. your boyfriend back. And what you're saying both is the speech to get your boyfriend back and also means something to say it to her. It had this amazing double meaning. And I felt when I was watching, it, I was like, I've never seen a scene like this about the intimacy that happens between women when they're talking about men, but the men are actually not the point. They're secondary, yeah. <laughs> they're secondary. Absolutely. It's like the women are trying to get to something in conversation with each other. Completely. And it really happened in that moment. I thought it was so sublime. Well, Issa, I wonder what it was like for you just even beginning to become a storyteller. Like, how did you find, how did you carve that space out? And did you try anything else first? Did you were you trying to audition as an actor? Um, or how did you come to I guess creating a show, because that's so hard. It's so yeah. hard to find interesting roles for women in Hollywood even now. Completely, I think I, I came from a place of trying to submit traditionally just via contests and writing spec scripts mm -hmm. and um, going with you know who you know and found constantly, even when I was uh, afforded the opportunity to get into the rooms that I my work didn't have an audience. Mm -hmm. And so I started creating content online and that's when you know, I found, oh, I have a direct access to an audience, so mm -hmm. what are they saying? What are executives talking about? And so that journey um, led me to continue creating content online and then got the attention of, you know, other networks. But it was definitely a rocky journey. I mean, I'm yeah. sure you can imagine, you, had, you came from Sundance initially, right? Yeah, yeah, it was a similar thing where I felt, at first I came to LA and I wanted to act, but, mm. That's not a job that you can just. No, you can't just show up, up and say, "Hey, cast me I'm here." Right? Yeah, you guys have been waiting for me, right? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and I found, I also found that I started to feel just icky, you know, standing in a line in the valley to go in to read for something that even if I got the part, I would feel sort of morally complicated about playing. What you know, parts were you getting? They were, I mean, they were the things you could go, that you could find as like open call auditions. You know, so ah. usually horror films, usually the character has like a name with a number in it, like, you know, <laughs> girl three, you know, and you go and you reach for that. And even as you're sitting in the parking lot being like, I think that was good, that was good. <laughs> you, you're also thinking, God, if I got this role, what would I feel about young women watching this portrayal of a, of a woman yet again? And I, at some point I started to just feel actually a kind of moral imperative to mm. write, that like, that, I, that there was no way to be an actress in the way I wanted to be if I didn't teach myself to write. And I was really not good at it in the beginning. I mean, I wrote, I wrote some really bad things that my friends, you know, would read and be like, Bless your friends, though, because that doesn't always happen. <laughs> yeah. But so you wrote to actually I be wrote able to... to act, yeah. And I think it's only now, I think it's only with the OA that I've started to feel like I like the writing part as much as I like the acting That's part. That's so interesting. It's yeah. reversed for me. I, 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 I wrote... I mean, I wrote to, you know, put an image out that I wasn't seeing. And right. I talked so much, Mess, just about, like, why aren't other people creating roles that are diverse and that yeah. aren't in the same, you know, stereotypical language and nature that we've seen? And so in, in writing roles for other people and directing and being behind the scenes, um, I accidentally cast myself. I didn't want to. I just felt like That's I so needed to because I couldn't, the, the person I wanted to cast was actually in, on the East Coast and I felt like I was running out of time yeah. and said, you know what, I'm just gonna play this role. But even to this day, I still feel like I, I appreciate writing more, I appreciate the behind the scenes elements more, and I'm falling more in love with okay. the acting given the people that I'm able to perform with. That's so interesting because I feel like there's something that comes with acting, this intense vulnerability, like you really are putting yourself on, a, on the line Absolutely. in a way. And then if you merge acting and writing, then the vulnerability is overwhelming because there's no, that's some version of you up there. Meaning even if it's a character, it's like you can't hide behind someone else's thing. You can't be like, well, I didn't, right. I didn't write that. Right. Or like, I didn't direct that. You know, you have to be like, no, I, I'm okay with every part of this yeah, apparently. And absolutely. that's a, intense place to be in, especially when the work meets an audience. You know, there's no place to hide. Like, Is that why you pref prefer, I read somewhere that you prefer to act in other people's product yeah, projects? Yeah, I like that because I feel like ultimately there's a limitation to my imagination. You know, like I've had a set of experiences and I, I draw from that and I draw from what I can imagine, but that's, that's a limited point of view. And there's something about when you're acting in an, incredible play and you're you're given sort of the confines of someone else's imagination mm -hmm. the landscape of their brain and heart to play in that i find really intoxicating but those parts for women are i mean still so few, few and far yeah. between i don't know i think that there's there seems to be a renaissance just in terms of you know i mean there's like a heightened awareness about yeah. like oh there are no women directors what that's an issue yeah. and you know, there are not very many women behind the scenes. And so yeah. now that people are paying attention, I feel like this happens in, in, in droves. Like people, history repeats itself or Hollywood is suddenly aware like, oh, where are the women? Yeah. And we're in that period now, but it feels like there are people behind the scenes currently that can, can make a difference and yeah. can make an impact and who are uh, people like Ryan Murphy and, and Ava DuVernay who are actually mm -hmm. um, making an effort uh, concentrated effort to employ people behind the scenes. And that, that makes me optimistic. And I, I, even on, on our own set, like that's what we're trying to do as well. We're, kind, we're hyper aware just about who we bring on and who we're mentoring yeah. and you know, who we can help rise in the ranks. Completely, I, we were fe we've felt that both times in making the writer's room. Like how do we make sure that this room feels like it's giving opportunity and space to the voices that we haven't heard from before, right. which has its own challenges because it means like you're also going to invest time in helping this group of people come to meet the opportunity because they haven't been afforded everything come along on. the way, which is, but obviously is the most important thing. We leave tomorrow. And the others? I'll take care of it. That's a detail. I will take care of them. 
I will not go with you. Are there any roles that you feel like, like I cannot do this for my soul because I, I can't sleep at night if I take this on? I've had a couple where I, I feel like something that can happen in this town is that, with women, is that a young woman is identified, you know, through some indie or some film or some something happens and suddenly her name is on the radar and the first thing that happens is that the girl is in the it girl list, mm -hmm. you know, which of course there isn't a list like that for men. Mm -mm. Part of that list, I think, is, comes with a shelf life. It's this idea that like women come into the system, they're recognized, they're the flavor of the year and then they're replaced because in the narratives that are being written for women, they are truly replaceable. Like, it, it doesn't necessarily matter. Ouch. And so I've had moments inside that where I have felt like, oh, everyone is saying, yes, you should do this. Like, this is a big deal to, you know, play opposite this person or to be in this. And then you read the script, you know, or in some cases, you're not even allowed to read the script. You know, they send you sort of like dummy sides and you, you're supposed to read for something and care about it that you don't even know what the narrative is. And somewhere inside that process, I started to just feel like this part of it, I can't do. Right. Like I, I feel too, um, like storytelling is inherently political and you have to draw your lines as to where your politics are and that, even if something seems like a step forward in your career, <laughs> if that's so many steps back in your perspective or your morality, then, then you're losing the very thing that you might have inside you that might be worth sharing with an audience, so. That's powerful, yeah. and it, it, I mean, it just draws me to the now because I feel like we're in a, in a time where we can say no, we can yeah. say and, and, and still continue to work yeah. because we, will create ultimately what we want to see. Yeah. And I think just given the, the short lifeline of women being able to work and be on screen in Hollywood, to be able to fall back on saying, well, I can at least continue to create yeah. is, is a tool. It's, it's, it's a necessity and it's, it, it, that's another reason why I remain optimistic. You're so right because it at the end of the day, it comes to this thing of like, can you support yourself in some way that lets you have choice, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, that it a, becomes a real position of power. I wonder if there was ever a moment for you when you felt like up against the line of like, well, maybe I'm gonna make this compromise because it will be some leap forward. Or was it always for you because you came from a writing perspective, like very clear that? I'm sure there were like extremely broke times. So I was <laughs> like, let me just, if I do this right now, you know, then I can, you know, then I can have the integrity later. And I think yeah. just even within the development process, yeah. you know, and, and, and being given an opportunity, you know, when you've created opportunities for either a very low budget or mm. just on a lower level, I've, I felt like in, once given the opportunity, I, I strove to kind of, um, to, to please mm. in a way, in a way that I mm. wouldn't have ever done before because I felt like, oh, this is, the only opportunity I'm gonna have to be able to do this. And so I should try to um, fit into what is expected of me. And mm. I've, I've noticed, I mean, that didn't work out, you know, because for me that, that led to becoming voiceless and kind of just like, I, I felt like Play-Doh. Like right. I could be molded into anything and that's not why I was hired or right. brought into the room in the first place. Right. And so I've had to learn to, to get a voice and to make sure that I don't, you know, Fall, that my voice doesn't fall by the wayside, yeah. but um, that was a journey in and of itself. Let's just ask Lisa. Lisa, what's on fleek? I don't know what that means. I know what that shit means. But being aggressively passive is what I do best. I don't know if you felt this the first go around, but I really felt like when we made the show the first time, this feeling of like, wow, nobody has ever done this quite oh. like this before. And I'm sure you felt that too. And now that you're going into Insecure for the second time, what, do you, what did you learn from the first go around and what do you still feel like terrified about? Or what is like, feels like a new leap forward that? I can say that I feel terrified about the fact that, you know, when you're creating for the first time and you touched on this earlier, you're, it's just you and your creative partners yeah. and you know, maybe a small writer's room and you're creating something that no one's seen before, no one has any expectations, no one um, 
no one knows anything. <laughs> and that's, there's just something so, so And someone's just giving you some that. money to do someone's it. Someone's just giving you some money and saying, hey, go play, see, we should, yeah. see what works. And so now, you know, the season is, it got bigger on social media and mm -hmm. I, I just, I do feel a bit nervous just about the expectations oh, and just about the hype and living up to that, but also not wanting to feel like I have to live up to that yeah. uh, with, within this hype culture. How do you, what do you do to protect yourself from that? Because I feel like creators in the past didn't have to deal with the same level Absolutely of not. awareness. Whereas no. like now you have this, I mean, uh, I remember seeing on YouTube something where you, people film themselves watching the OA. Yes. And it's an amazing tool for writing because you're watching them beat by beat respond to story. Yeah. And so you're thinking like, God, this is an amazing tool. Like I can see where the story dropped them here and they were a bit confused and then it caught them here. and. That's it's really useful, yes, but absolutely. at the same time, it's terrifying because you get so much feedback that how do, you, how do you go about making a season two that feels pure? How do you protect yourself, I guess? I mean, we continue to have the real conversations uh, in the writer's room that, you know, we, that kept us going in the first place. Mm -hmm. And we constantly look at what the, the center of the show is. The center of the show is the show about, you know, two black female friends. And constantly make sure and check in that mm. we're staying true to that. But I mean, even with you guys, there's tons of fan theories and fan <laughs> fiction. Do you ever go through yes, and so read everything and listen to everything? And yeah, has anybody ever been one accurate? And have you ever felt compelled to change the direction because of what you've read? Oh, that's so interesting. You know, it, what's, what's cool is that um, Zalbot Monglage and I who created, we wrote the show together, we spent a good year and a half up front just trying to crack the sort of labyrinth of the oh, mind bender. So intricate. To think about how if we got, you know, three, four, five, you know, books or parts or series seasons out, what would the true ending be? And I think what's really cool is so far, no one has managed to figure out that math. Like I think if they had, we'd be like, oh wow, we've got to really, we've got to somehow leap ahead. But I think because we invested the time up front, um, we sort of get to be in this position of um, the story can change and morph, but mm. there's a place that it's going that it could arrive at that was in the very first chapter from the beginning. And that's a kind of relaxing feeling because then at least you're still driving the ship of the narrative rather than sort of being driven by um, response. But at the same time, there are things that people observed in the in the first season you know there was a something our production designer Alex DiGirlando did he's an amazing creative force and he had taken something in one of the offices where they had ripped the sign down and in the leftover adhesive was actually braille with wow. a message written in it and within like 48 hours of the show being I mean we thought that would maybe take months for people to find or never but within like the first week they're, like that was all over Reddit. <laughs> You're just like, whoa. That's the, insane. The audience is so advanced now. They're, they're so advanced. They take the time. Yeah. They, I mean, you're in constant discussion. I mean, water cooler conversations have been replaced with, by Twitter conversations yeah. and social media conversations. And I feel like people are more invested in shows yeah. more now more than ever. I do wonder, just given that your show was made to binge, essentially, yeah. is there any element that you miss about because I can't imagine like if Insecure had aired just for people to ingest at one time. And it's how funny that, that I ideal. did that. I, I was thinking to myself, like when I came to it, I was like, wow, this is the kind of show that people really get breath with. And for me, I think I had never seen anything like it. So as I was watching your show, I like couldn't believe that I was getting access to this kind of voice. <laughs> so it was just like, give me more, give me more. Um, but I know what you mean. I mean, I've thought a lot about what it means to get paused, to sit with narrative. And I think something that's happening with the OA that's interesting is people are watching it for a th second and yeah. third time. And you kind of have to though. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I mean, to your credit, just to fully digest everything. And I think even you told me that you shot uh, like the, a film. the first season like a film. Yeah. So how did that help? And how did that, given that especially that you're going to try to shoot it yeah, like a television show? <laughs> yeah. season two. Um, I think the things that were awesome about almost everyone coming from a film background and approaching it like an eight hour film is that we wrote all eight hours up front. And so we really knew what we were getting into mm -hmm. and it could be really layered in its realization because we knew the final moments as we were shooting the beginning moments. 
Um, and it was also amazing in the edit because as you're rewriting in the edit, you know, we'd get to play a place in chapter seven where you'd recut a scene and it would mean something completely mm. different. And then you could still go back to chapter two and be like, well, we have to introduce this character differently because we know the payoff in seven is different. And that, that ability to be holistic about something was fantastic. But at the same time, how do you do some, how do you create an eight hour film, you know, year after year? I don't know. So we're trying to figure out, you know, what can we borrow more from how TV is made and what can we take from what we love about film and find a new hybrid? And I think that's exciting about the time that we're in right now yeah. is it's like the wild west of storytelling. Absolutely. And the storytellers get to be pioneers as to like what the form looks like, what the production looks like, what the content looks like. And yeah, even in our second season, we're playing with different ways to tell the story and mm. different devices, and that is so exciting to me, not to be confined to a specific way of storytelling, which is, you know, so new to all of us. This makes me so excited for season two. I wish you were done already. <laughs>